Hi, everyone. Well, it probably won't surprise you to know that The Economist is one of my must-reads. And so when I came across just a few weeks ago the magazine's book review and saw uh, two published books, and I thought, this is just perfect for our program. And so I'm so pleased that Jonathan Kaufman and James Carter could join us for what is absolutely an exceptional pairing. And I really can't think of a, a better moderator than Meredith Hindley, who came to Dallas about three years ago. I'm Jim Falk, President of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, and welcome to today's program, Shanghai and Hong Kong, the past and future of China. And in light of the recent events in Hong Kong, today's program is especially timely. And frankly, it's awfully nice to sit inside rather than be outside where it's 105 degrees in Dallas-Fort Worth. You know, the council is able to host programs like this afternoon's due to the generosity of many of you. And I'd particularly like to recognize Ray and Dion Termini. You've heard me mention their names before because they both have supported our webinars in the past. So I said that I met Meredith about three years ago. And even though we're featuring two other books, Meredith, I couldn't help but pick this up. This is the book that Meredith uh, wrote about three years ago. Destination Casablanca, Exile, Espionage, and the Battle for North Africa in World War II. And as some of you know, I'm the Honorary Consul for Morocco, so I had a special interest in this book, and it is a thriller. So I hope you'll pick that up as well. And uh, Meredith, of course, is a well-known historian who also works at the National Endowment for Humanities. So with that, Meredith, I'm gonna sit back and enjoy today's conversation. Thank, thanks to all of you for participating. Thank you so much for having me back. Uh, the event that I did with the uh, World Affairs Council was one of my favorite. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be back here today to talk about two books that I think you will find absorbing and interesting and have a lot to speak about what's going on today. So I'm gonna start by introducing our authors. And uh, today we are thrilled to have with us two people who have dedicated their careers to studying, writing and teaching on China. James Carter is professor of history and current department chair at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, where his research and teaching focus on late imperial and modern China. Uh, James is the author of three books. Author Jeffrey Wasserstrom has called Champions Day, the work of a seasoned China specialist in top form, delivering engrossing stories, engaging arguments, and enticing details, a cultural history trifecta. It's a review everybody always wants to get. Uh, Jonathan Kaufman is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, editor, author. He's worked as the executive editor for Bloomberg News in addition to working as the China Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal. He's also the author of three books. The Economist called his most recent work, The Last Kings of Shanghai, illuminating. Kaufman currently serves as the director of Northeastern University School of Journalism. So I'd like to start off today by asking you both to talk about how you came to write your book. What was the idea? What inspired you? Why don't we start with uh, Jonathan? Well, I was uh, actually a young reporter um, right after China opened up. This was back in 1979. And I was in China um, right out of college, walking through Shanghai. And this was sort of the still the kind of bad old days of China. Mao had only died a few years before. Everybody was still wearing their Mao suits. Things were very rigidly controlled. And I was walking along the Bund in Shanghai, that beautiful waterfront with the Art Deco buildings that are so famous. And frankly, I was looking for a place to go to the bathroom. And so I stepped into the Peace Hotel, this beautiful Art Deco building right there on the Bund. And I felt like I had uh, stepped into a 1930s movie. Um, the, the floors were marble. There were these beautiful Lalique windows everywhere. The bellhops were dressed in white with little, uh, with little caps on top. And then when I asked directions to the bathroom, the bellhop responded to me in French. And so I was trying to make sense of how in kind of communist China, a place like this even existed. And I think for journalists, you know, every good story starts with a question. So that kind of set me down the road to try to explore who built this hotel, what else did they build, who else was involved with this. And that led me um, to these families, the Sassoons and the Kaduris, uh, Jewish families actually who had come from Baghdad to Shanghai and then stood astride China's uh, business and politics uh, for more than 150 years. And it was a story that no one, not even many Chinese knew about. And, and that was the, the way I started the book, Last Kings of Shanghai. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, James. My career, as you were mentioning earlier, has been focused on, uh, on modern China. And in particular, I've, I've really tried to find topics that have talked about the interconnection between China and the West. Um, so I began way up in Manchuria, looking at some of the Russian influence in, in the city of Harbin, uh, and then spent some time over the next few years gradually finding uh, more pleasant places to work and do research. Um, and there's no place better to study the, the uh, contact between China and the West than Shanghai. Um, it's it is a is a place that is neither Western nor Chinese. It's it's essentially both. You can't you can't separate out of those those elements. Um, and so when I was looking around for a project uh, in Shanghai, um, it you know came to my attention that um, you know this big park in the center of the city was uh, the reason it wasn't a square, even though it's called People's Square. It's uh, it's an oval, and the reason it's an oval is because it's a, a former racetrack. Uh, and if, in fact, if you look at it from above, you can see very clearly the outline of the, way, the racetrack and you can even see some of the outlines of the previous racetracks before. So that was really the way I started to get into it. And the, um, in a way that historians work, we, we like to think that we ask questions that we don't know the answers to in advance. And that really um, kind of got me started off on the wrong foot because I spent about a week in this old, uh, this old Jesuit library, um, which is in the outskirts of Shanghai. It's, it's now really in the city. It used to be somewhat separate from the center of town. Um, but it's an old Jesuit library, and there was a church there, an orphanage there, and a whole complex. And that's where one of the best research libraries for studying the foreign presence in China is. And uh, I had read in a book that the last champions race for the, for the racetrack was May the 5th, I think it was, um, of 1941. And so I spent about a week in there trying, you know, figuring out May the 5th and what was the story I could tell around that because I'd gotten this idea that a narrative around one particular day was going to work out. Um, and then I said, well, let's just for fun, let's see how this played out. So what did people do when they realized that the Champions Day wasn't happening in the fall? And then I got to November of 1941. I kept waiting for that big moment of something bad to happen. It never did. So I realized that November 12th, 1941 was actually the last Champions Day. So um, all those things came together and got me launched into, into this one particular day that I think tells a lot of the threads that are, uh, that are present in the story of, of modern China and in the story of modern Shanghai. Both of your books are grounded in Shanghai in the international settlement and in the French concession. And so could we, I'd like to start off by talking about what exactly that was and how it worked, because that's central to both of your books. Um, so basically China, while it did have a lot of trading with the West, it was very much out of certain cities. Most Westerners were not allowed to travel throughout China very freely or to do business there. Um, and, uh, but then uh, when Britain went to war uh, against China in the 1840s to expand the opium trade, it was a war for business, not for territorial conquest. One of the concessions they got was that Shanghai would be open to um, international trade and that they'd be able to establish a settlement there. Now, the Chinese, I think, figured, I mean, James can weigh in on this too, but my sense is the Chinese anticipated that the foreigners would come in and after a few years they'd leave. They would just kind of wait the foreigners out. So they gave them a, a parcel of land that was the least desirable in all of Shanghai. It was old, it was swampy, there were graves down there, maybe there were ghosts there. And um, the, uh, the Chinese figured that the Westerners would settle there and soon be, soon be driven out. Um, and in fact, it was a terrible, uh, it was a terrible area. There were all sorts of diseases. When you read the, what, what the, the first British settlers talk about, they talk about, you know, foot diseases, uh, uh, all sorts of fevers, their clothes never get dry. It was really a terrible place to live, but it turned out Shanghai was a great place to make money. And what happened over time was that more and more people, first the British, then the French, then the Americans, um, ultimately the Japanese, came to Shanghai and got these concessions, which essentially meant that they ran these um, districts uh, independent of the Chinese government. And I think in many ways, the international settlement was almost a republic of business. It was run by businessmen, the, the municipal council that ran the international settlement, which later absorbed the American settlement, um, was made up almost completely of, of British and American businessmen. So this in a way was kind of a, the dream of, of businesses. You know, Let's have a place where we can do trade, where we set all the rules, and, and that was a way um, to make a lot of money uh, in this country where people saw just tremendous uh, potential for a market. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I echo everything that Jonathan said. I would add to it. Um, so the, the principle that really under, underlay 
the foreign presence in, in Shanghai and in much of China was this principle of extraterritoriality, right? So it was the idea that if you were a British citizen in China, you were not subject to Chinese law, you were subject to British law. So that the, the foreigners who were living in Shanghai, whether they were Japanese or, or American or British or French, um, they, for the most part, were subject to the, the laws of their own country. Um, so it was a very strange, it was a very strange place. It, it was not, you know, it, it quacked like a colony, it walked like a colony, it swam like a colony, but it wasn't a colony. But the only way that it wasn't a colony was a name. So it was, it was run by businessmen, as, as Jonathan was saying, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a political entity, although a lot of these business uh, folk took over those political roles. The key, the key event, I think, that, that, um, is, that maybe messed up those plans that the Chinese government might have relied on that the foreigners would leave was the Taiping Rebellion. Um, when you had the Taiping War in the middle of the 19th century, which is the largest civil war uh, in, in human history, as best we can tell, somewhere between 30 and 60 million people may have died, um, and happening around the same time as the American Civil War. And um, during that time period, because the Chinese government was in genuine danger of collapse, the foreigners in Shanghai gained a lot more autonomy because they were able to um, pool their resources, protect their interests, and then Chinese in the area flooded into the foreign settlement, the international settlement, because it was more stable and, and more secure than, than the Chinese areas around them. So after the 1850s and in the 1860s, that foreign settlement really became much more autonomous than it had been beforehand. And by that point, um, as, as Jonathan put it nicely, it is a republic of business that goes about making money and keeps it up and well into the 20th century. One thing, if I can just add, is that, you know, we may think, well, businessmen were running it, so it must have been sort of a very conservative, repressive enclave. But the irony, I think, was that in some ways, the international settlement was the most politically liberal part of China. Uh, the, the Chinese empire and then later the nationalists were very concerned about dissent, very concerned about rebellions. But because the British and the Americans, the French were running these areas, they had much more of a laissez-faire attitude towards Chinese political dissent against China. They didn't want it against themselves, but they wanted it, uh, they, they, um, they uh, uh, didn't mind it against China. So part of what gives Shanghai its flavor, and I think, you know, James captures this terrifically in his book, is that you not only had my, the families I write about, the Kaduris and the Sassoons, these billionaire families living in these 43 room mansions. You also have Mao Zedong renting his first apartment in Shanghai in the international settlement. You have Zhou Enlai hosting parties in the French concession. So you had this kind of clash of capitalism and communism, foreigners and Chinese, all in this very concentrated area. And that's what gave Shanghai, I think it's, it's glamor, but also the incredible ferment that, that made it such a compelling place. Yeah, it's not a coincidence that the Communist Party was founded in Shanghai, right? It was, the, it was a city of extremes and uh, those extremes included what the image you just saw, um, folks who were living, uh, living high on the hog, but you also had a lot of poverty. Um, you had a lot of industrial workers. It was, it was the one place in Shanghai that was in China that was heavily industrialized. And that's why you had both those extremes. That gave, so the Chinese Communist Party is born in Shanghai, but also Shanghai is, you know, these images that we've been seeing is old Shanghai, glamour and glitz and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, just really things that you wouldn't see anywhere else in the world, never mind anywhere else in China. Jonathan has this line in his book where he says, Shanghai was a city of easy money and easy morals. What was the easy money in Shanghai? How did people make their money? Well, the, the Sassoon family, which I write about, made their money on opium. And this is something the family today doesn't like to talk about, but you know, there's that famous line that every great fortune is built on a crime. And um, the, uh, the, the China was opened up, as I say, not for conquest, but, but for business. And these big British firms uh, convinced the British government uh, to invade Shanghai and open it up for trade. What's interesting is the Sassoon family were actually upstarts. They were Jewish merchants, Jewish financiers, quite prosperous, quite prominent in Baghdad, who had made their way to India. And then when China opened up, David Sassoon, the patriarch, took a look at it and thought, there's a great deal of money to be made here. And I think what's interesting about Shanghai is that the business people it attracted, it was in a way the Silicon Valley of its day. You know, if you were young, if you were ambitious, if you wanted to get away from kind of the old rules, Shanghai was a place where people who were very young, 
could make a lot of money very quickly. And so the Sassoons end up being very innovative. They invest money in things like steamships, which allow them to get their opium from India to China faster. They invest in the telegraph, um, which allows them to get information faster. So here you see in this picture, um, the Sassoon family, the father and two of the sons still dress like they're living in Baghdad in the 1830s, but then one of their sons dressed like a British gentleman in his waistcoat. So Shanghai became a way for this family to become extraordinarily rich. And one of the things that uh, the Chinese, when the Chinese communists conquered Shanghai, they seized all the Sassoon business records. And they discovered that the Sassoons probably made about $2.3 billion dollars B for billion, um, selling opium and then investing that money in real estate and other areas. So it really was an astonishing fortune that was made, um, but it was built on it was built on uh, on opium. And much as you could hear people today say, well, there were cigarettes and there's alcohol, opiums like that. I think there's a moral question there. I mean, it is true opium was legal. Uh, the people in Britain used opium. Uh, the Sassoons actually curried favor with the British royalty by selling them stock in their opium stores. But the fact is they knew how dangerous opium was. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Chinese emperor was furiously opposed to it, saw what was going on. I think roughly about 12% of Chinese um, people were addicted to opium. Um, if you compare what's going on now with the opioid crisis here, you can only imagine a, a crisis maybe five or six times that that uh, that much larger what it did to China. And so the legacy of that is quite serious and something that the Chinese, you know, even talk about today. And, and I would, um, th absolutely. And one other piece that's really important to keep in mind, you asked about how people were making their money, um, is Shanghai is a, a, a city of immigrants. But it's really important to keep in mind that most of those immigrants are from other parts of China. So you have, even in the international settlement, where we, so we've talked about it, how it be, being run by foreign um, businessmen for the most part, um, more than 90% of the international settlement, and then by more than 90%, getting over 95% in all likelihood, were Chinese. So most of those people were Chinese, and most of them weren't from Shanghai. Most of them were coming to the city because of the opportunities that it, that it uh, represented. Um, and then people were making money in, all, in, in any way that you could make money, kind of literally. Um, and so it was a thriving business community, and it uh, really was fueled by it, its position at the at the opening of the Yangtze River into into the sea. So it it became very quickly, even though it wasn't it was uh, excuse me, it wasn't expected to be the most prosperous of the um, treaty ports that were opened after the Opium War. I mean, kind of to Jonathan's point earlier, there's no there's no question that opium uh, was a problem because a war had been fought to open China to uh, to the opium trade to maintain the opium trade in China. Um, but Shanghai then thrived after that, and it really was thriving largely because of this combination, again, of, of foreign interest and um, the Chinese population. So people were making money um, in all sorts of ways, exploiting one another and uh, exploiting opportunities. So one of the epicenters of social life and business life in Shanghai is the Shanghai Race Club. And um, James, can you talk a little bit about how it came to be and what it represented? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, the racetrack is a, first of all, there's racetracks all over China. Um, the, they come along with the, with the influx of British imperialism. So you see a racetrack, you still see the one in Hong Kong at the center of, of Hong Kong Island called Happy Valley, um, which is a place I really recommend people get to um, if we didn't have to worry about so many things that are keeping us from getting to Hong Kong right now. But um, you also had, you had racetracks in Beijing, you had racetracks in Tianjin, you had racetracks in, up and down the coast. And in Shanghai um, is really the, the largest of them all. Um, maybe the first one, the people in Hong Kong and Shanghai have some dispute about which one started racing first. But Shanghai and Hong Kong had a rivalry over their racetrack. And the racetrack in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in Shanghai was designed as a place for the, what are called Shanghai landers. So these, uh, the, the foreign residents of Shanghai, who I describe as being, you know, mostly white, mostly male, mostly wealthy, um, they come and they try to recreate a little piece of Britain in China, in Shanghai. Uh, and they build a couple of different locations, but the one that they settle on is the one that we saw earlier in the map of the international settlement. I mean, it's clearly visible, uh, and it's visible today still because it is this spot of green, this kind of green lung at the center of, of the city, um, and it became uh, wildly popular, and not just popular among, among the British residents or the foreign residents, it was tremendously popular among Chinese. About 90% of the crowd 
on any given day would have been Chinese and so popular that it, uh, they opened up two more racetracks, um, which were both Chinese run uh, in different parts of the city. So it was really an essential part of, of social life. Um, now, it needs to be said at the same time, it was also intensely racist. Um, it was uh, the club did not admit Chinese members. Um, and that stayed the case all through its existence. They never admitted uh, Chinese members, and it was a whites-only uh, policy. That said, um, especially, and we'll get into the details of some of this perhaps later, when most of Shanghai was invaded and occupied by the Japanese, you have this one piece in the middle of the city which remains neutral, and that's where the racetrack was. And so a lot of the Chinese owners who had had horses in these surrounding areas came into the international settlement, and they were welcomed into the club, as affiliate members. So you could maintain the fiction that you weren't letting Chinese into the club, but in fact, you were sitting side by side with, with Chinese people. So it, it is a, I think a real, a real example of how Shanghai operated. So it was, it was cynical, it was pragmatic, it was, you know, it was appalling, it was wonderful, it was all these things at the same time. And that was, that was part of why the Shanghai Race Club was such, I thought, a symbol for this, this end of old Shanghai. And I, I would kind of bookend that with, you know, after the races were over, there's a good chance a lot of those people went to the Peace Hotel, um, which was where I went looking for a bathroom uh, that started me on this journey. Um, but back then was known as the Cafe Hotel. And it was built by Victor Sassoon, um, who was uh, one of the members of the Sassoon family, um, who actually his family had sort of written off as a playboy. Um, they basically thought, you know, he had gone to Oxford, done okay. He always seemed to have a chorus girl on either arm. And um, his, his family basically thought he was a bit of a wastrel. But he ends up being sent to India and then to Shanghai and takes over the family business and turns out to be incredibly shrewd and smart. And here you can see, this is Victor Sassoon in Shanghai. You know, what, what British playboy wouldn't love a life like this? You know, surrounded by beautiful women, um, the richest man in town, and he turned the Cafe Hotel really into his private club. He would have these parties where he would make everybody dress up um, as, as circus performers or, or as, as if they were going to a boarding school, and he would be the ringmaster. I mean, that's where the kind of sense of, of almost Weimar Germany begins to develop um, of this kind of wild party scene. But what's interesting about the Cafe Hotel and, and all the hotels in Shanghai, these great hotels, a lot of well-to-do Chinese made their way there as well. And I would argue that much like the racetrack, it's where many Chinese first began to encounter the West, right? They couldn't necessarily travel to London or travel to New York or, or travel widely, but they could step onto the racetrack, they could step into the lobby of the Cafe Hotel and get a sense of this wider world. And I think it also began to change a lot of their views. There's a wonderful story I tell in my book with um, a Chinese entrepreneur who becomes one of the wealthiest Chinese in, in, uh, in Shanghai, Chinese capitalist, uh, moves to Shanghai from a, from a town outside. Um, and uh, he's about to open his business. And everyone knows the idea of feng shui, this idea of how you organize your office and the windows in the right position and so forth. And so his brothers who are still back in the, the town outside of Shanghai say, well, you've got to get your feng shui master and make sure you locate your headquarters right. And he writes back to them and says, no, no, I want to be near the Bund, near all the British businessmen, because the phone lines are better. And, and that's kind of a way in which you see that this was not just um, imperialism exploiting Shanghai, which it did, and colonialism, which it was. There was also a way, I think I would argue, that Shanghai ignited Chinese uh, globalization. It sort of opened this, this, this view of the world that um, many Chinese businessmen then seized upon. And really today, when you go to Shanghai, Shanghai still feels different than the rest of China. That's still true. And I think part of it is because the kind of generations in Shanghai have grown up with this awareness of foreigners, this, this fascination with foreigners, doing business, valuing those kind of global contexts. And that's something even under communism that still I think persists under the surface. Well, to, to the focus of Jonathan's book, I mean, that the Cathay Hotel, I mean, the, the, the jazz band, the, you know, comes to called the Peace Hotel Jazz Band. Um, after the reopening of China in the, in the 80s, um, you start to have these, this jazz band is playing and you realize they have these, these, these men in their 80s and in their 90s um, who are playing jazz and they, they, they've still been playing all along and all of a sudden they come out and they are, you know, the house band at the Cathay Hotel. Um, so yeah, Shanghai is some remarkable um, opportunities that 
that it seems like they couldn't possibly persist after World War II and after the Communist Revolution, and yet they, they did. And, and Jonathan's very right. Shanghai does feel very different than a lot of other cities in China, for, for better and for worse. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the, um, the status of Jews in Shanghai, because both of your books touch on that in different ways. And what did it mean to be Jewish in Shanghai in, in terms of social status and opportunity that perhaps were not available in, say, Paris or London or maybe even Bombay? So um, I, I think to understand, again, the families I write about, the Sassoons and the Kaduris, there were, like any city, like any major city, um, there were different kinds of Jews, right? There were some Eastern European Jews, some Jews who had fled Russia. But the Jews I write about came from Baghdad, and they really saw themselves as the business elite. So this is a picture of Eli Kaduri, uh, who came from Baghdad, and his two sons. And I would compare them much more to, say, Michael Bloomberg or you know, Jewish um, uh, uh, folks who work on Wall Street, or prominent Jewish businessmen that we see in the United States today. Um, these were Jews who, I mean, they had a cultural identity as being Jews. Um, I sometimes joke that Victor Sassoon, the playboy surrounded by the chorus girls, was far more likely to give money to a synagogue than to actually set foot in one. Um, and so um, from a cultural point of view, they, they saw themselves as Jewish. They were aware of being outsiders, but they also, because they were so wealthy and well-connected, were also able to eventually become knighted by the British Empire. Um, the Kaduris end up going to Hong Kong, and then uh, they, uh, one of them becomes a member of the House of Lords. Um, they entertain royalty. So I think for these Jewish families, Shanghai was a way to sort of enter the British aristocracy. At the same time, on the ground, day to day, there's a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism. Um, there are stories told the Shanghai Club, which was a, a famous gathering spot, um, did not allow Jews to join. Um, Victor Sassoon was allowed to go because he was so wealthy and everybody wanted to go to his parties. But there are these stories told about him going in, sitting down at the bar in his best clothes, and people far junior and far poorer than him shouting at him, go back to Baghdad, go back to Baghdad. So I think on a social level, um, there was this kind of anti-Semitism um, that, um, that existed. But Shanghai was a very cosmopolitan place. And it was a place that if you were wealthy enough, barriers did begin to fall. And one of the things I think the Chinese nationalists recognized when they were running China was that these Western businessmen, and especially the Sassoons and the Kaduris, could be useful to them. They could be useful allies. So they would wine and dine Victor Sassoon um, and use him as a way to kind of get financing and so forth. And there was this fascination actually with Jews that China had going back to Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen is sort of the George Washington of China. And uh, in 1919, 1918, he actually endorses the Balfour Declaration that's calling for the creation of the State of Israel, in part because the Kadoris are working with him and, and supporting him. So even today, um, in my experience, when you go to China and talk to them about Jews or about Israel, there's a real fascination with Jews. And you don't run into the kind of as many anti-Semitic canards that maybe you run into in other countries. So um, in the end, most Jews who lived in China had very warm feelings about it and, uh, and felt a real affection for it. And so there is another strand, of course, and, and I had, this kind of parallels my own career. Um, so I first wrote about the city of Harbin up in Manchuria, and Manchuria was a place where a lot of Russian Jews had come in the late 19th century. And that was kind of the, one of the most common routes for Jewish immigration into China was to go through Manchuria, into, um, through, through Siberia, into Manchuria and Harbin, and then down to Shanghai. And then a lot of them then moved uh, out into Australia. But um, that was present in Shanghai as well. And a lot of that group of, of, they were refugees, really, for the most part. And so they were pretty, uh, they were not of the class, uh, the economic class that you have with the Sassoons and the Kaduris or the Hardoons, who, who are people who show up in my book as well. Um, but what uh, Jonathan had mentioned about the Shanghai Club and, and Victor Sassoon could get in the Shanghai Club because of how wealthy he was, you had the same thing at the racetrack. So the racetrack had this sort of clubby anti-Semitism that I, I think is very British, uh, maybe a lot of kind of American Ivy League. It was 
Um, it was, they didn't like to talk about it, but they didn't want to include Jewish members if they could help it, but they were happy to let people in if they had a lot of money. So um, Silas Hardoon got into the, into the race club and the Sassoons were tremendously successful. In fact, um, uh, David Sassoon, um, who was the, uh, who was not, not the focus in, in uh, Jonathan's book, but he was kind of the George Steinbrenner of his day at the racetrack. In fact, he was so successful buying up the best race horses at the club that the rest of the club d despaired that there was never any competition because Sassoon horses kept winning all the time and ultimately he left Shanghai. He came back later on, but eventually he left because he, he kind of had succeeded in every way that he could and everybody resented it. Now, was there anti-Semitism inside that resentment? I think probably so. Um, but it, it is the, the Jewish community of, of Shanghai is as complex as any other community within Shanghai for sure. We have this thriving cosmopolitan city in the 20s and 30s. It's making money, and then World War II happens. Um, so what was uh, Shanghai's relationship with the Japanese? Let's talk about that for a little bit, because the city itself becomes sort of a pawn, but also the international settlement is kind of protected for a while um, by the Japanese and also the Chinese. Yeah. Sure, I'll start. I think, um, so, so my book has three different events that are going on in, on this one day in 1941. And one is the last Champions Day, um, which is a public holiday because it's the, the height of the race season. The second is the funeral of Liza Hardoon, who is the wealthiest woman in Asia. And she really taps into this Jewish thread we've been talking about. She's half French and half Chinese, um, raised as Chinese, marries one of the, the wealthiest of, of, of the Jewish merchants in the city. And then the third piece is up north. There's a celebration of Sun Yat-sen's birthday in the northern part of the city. Now that becomes important when you're talking about the Japanese. So remember in 1937 um, is when the war between China and Japan really starts. So in the United States, we tend to think of World War II as starting with Pearl Harbor, December 7th of 1941, or maybe we want to talk about it in 1939 when it, when it starts in Europe. But the, um, and, and Meredith, you've got your own writings about how it goes on in, in other parts, in other places. Um, but in China, it had begun in, 1930, in summer of 1937, at the very latest. And so by the fall of 1937, all of Shanghai, except for the international settlement and the French concession, these international pieces in the center of, of town, were controlled by the Japanese. And that stays the case until December 8th, uh, on their side of the dateline in 1941. So I think that what what's really a fascinating moment for what I'm writing about, and it appears also in, in Jonathan's book, but this particular moment is, the way I've described it in various places, is that it's as though sort of Wile E. Coyote going off the edge of a cliff. Um, he hasn't looked down and realized that there's nothing holding him up anymore, so he hasn't started falling. But that's Shanghai in these couple of years between 1937 and 1941, that it's, it's inevitable that the war is going to happen. But then when, it, when the Japanese armies leave the center of Shanghai, for a couple of months and then for a couple more months and then for a couple of years, then people start to think, well, maybe this can continue going on. But always in the background, there is this threat. I mean, and literally you can look outside the racetrack or from the roof of the hotel and you can see Japanese armies there. Um, there is one very bloody called Bloody Saturday in, in August of 1937, which leads to about a thousand people being killed in the, inter in the international settlement. But other than that, there's not a lot of violence from the war in the settlement itself, but it is looming over the over the city throughout this period. Now, one way I think the war is also coming home to Shanghai is that starting in 1937, um, remember Shanghai is this international hub. Cruise ships have been coming there, bringing Charlie Chaplin and Noel Coward and Wallace Simpson. They're staying at the Cafe Hotel. They're going to these great parties. But starting in 1937, these, sh these um, ships start showing up carrying Jewish refugees who are fleeing Berlin and Vienna. And at this point, uh, basically every other country in the world has shut its doors um, to Jews trying to flee Nazism. Uh, ships are being turned away. Jews are, are desperate to get out. And so because Shanghai, as we've described, was in a sense run by no one, just these sort of different sectors, if you got to Shanghai, you could uh, get in without a visa. In other words, if you made it to Shanghai, you could be saved. And so word spreads throughout Europe, but especially in Vienna and Berlin, and a lot of these Jews, they're middle or upper middle class, they have the money to book a passage, 
on these cruise ships to make their way to Shanghai. Now remember, these are you know Jewish merchants, professionals, lawyers, doctors, music musicians. They don't speak Chinese. They're still dressed as if for a, a Berlin winter. And they're suddenly showing up in sweltering Shanghai, surrounded by you know all these uh, all these Chinese. And I think at that moment, in a way, Victor Sassoon, despite being a playboy and, and the Kaduris and others, have their great Oscar Schindler moment, which is these Jews are coming off the, the ships and they decide to step in and help them. Now, remember, these are businessmen. They're not social welfare workers. There's no infrastructure to help thousands of refugees pouring into the city. But they really rise to the occasion. Victor Sassoon turns over a number of his buildings to refugees. Um, he sets up a secret bank account to help um, get these refugees started because he doesn't want the Japanese to know about it. Uh, the Kaduri start a school to educate the children um, of many of these refugees. They're doing a lot. But in a way, the most important thing Victor Sassoon is doing is he's basically, I believe, in this great con game with the Japanese. You know, you're asking about anti-Semitism. The Japanese were very anti-Semitic. They believed that Jews controlled the world. They believed that Jews controlled the world economy. But they also believed that if the Jews were on your side, they could be helpful. And so one of the things that they decide, the Japanese do, is the noose closes around Shanghai. They identify Victor Sassoon as very important because they believe that he might be able to convince Roosevelt to stay out of the war and to convince the British to stay out of the war. And Victor Sassoon, being a very smart businessman and, and used to closing deals, does nothing to disabuse them of that notion. So he'll entertain them at the hotel, he'll uh, wine and dine them, and he'll say, bring your officers to my nightclub. Of course, he's having his uh, waiters and bartenders at his nightclub spy on the Japanese, um, probably for the British uh, Secret Service. He, on his own, is flying to South America to see if he can buy up land um, for a place to resettle these refugees. But he ends up being very effective dealing with the Japanese and persuading them to protect these Jews um, who were arriving to the point that even later in the war, the, the, the Japanese finally catch on to Victor Sassoon. He has to flee Shanghai. But their view of the Jews is so shaped by both their history, but also by, by Victor and, 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 and other things they've heard, that even when the Nazis have a formal alliance with the Japanese and the Nazis send members of the Gestapo to Shanghai and say, look, you've got these 18,000 refugees here, you've got a Jewish problem. The way you solve it is put them all on uh, ships, drag them out to the center of the river in front of the cafe hotel, and then sink the boats. It was a very Nazi type solution. But the Japanese refused to do that. Um, so in a way, when, when the war comes to Shanghai, it's coming from two directions, from the Japanese directly, and then what, what everyone is seeing with these, Nazi, these refugees of Nazism uh, pouring into the city um, with nowhere else to go. Let's talk about Shanghai's fate after the war. Are there seeds that are laid in the 20s and 30s that influence what happened to Sh Shanghai's fate um, once it's taken over by the communists and, and to make the city that we have today? I'll, I'll let me start because Jonathan, then you can, can probably segue into Hong Kong because that's where your story goes much more than mine. So I think um, what you see with, with Shanghai is, is you see very few bright lines in Shanghai. So when you talk about the end of old Shanghai, like the, the, the problem in talking about the end of old Shanghai is it doesn't end in one moment. So much as narratively, I would love to have November 12th, 1941, and all of a sudden everybody wakes up the next morning like, oh no, it's gone. Um, actually, the races continue. Um, so they continue for one more season under Japanese control, even with many of the British and Americans still involved. Um, and then after that, the British and Americans are put into internment camps or sent back to, um, to their home countries. Um, and they continue to run the races, the Japanese do, um, for the, much of the remainder of the war. In Chinese newspapers, I found ads for the races still going on in August of 1945, so just weeks before the atomic bombs dropped. So um, Shanghai was the city in, in Asia that was probably least damaged uh, by the war because the Japanese preserved a lot of what was going on, I think probably to persuade the European and American powers that if they would just stop fighting, that they could continue to have the same kind of colonialism or imperialism that they'd had before. Um, but of course, it didn't work out that way. And then the war, um, the war ends and then the civil war starts very quickly thereafter. 
some of the people involved in my book, um, Cornell Franklin, the American, he goes back to Shanghai as soon as the war ends and he wants to open the racetrack again. Um, and he can't understand why people don't, don't want to do it. And eventually it, it doesn't work. Um, but for, for my, for my story, um, that's when the lights sort of go out in Shanghai. And, and as I mean, China historians often look at, at Shanghai during the second kind of that third quarter of the 20th century. So from 1950 ish till into the 1980s, um, it's very much neglected. Um, it had been this economic engine and, and all the money goes to other places. Um, even when China starts to reopen in the 1980s, very little money goes into Shanghai. It's not until after the 1989 Tiananmen Square um, movement is crushed that then Deng Xiaoping is looking for a way to jumpstart economic reform. And then he says, okay, well, I'm going to pull out my ace in the hole, which is Shanghai. And that's when all the skyscrapers that you see that are now, you know, I think three of the 10 tallest buildings in the world are there in Shanghai. All of that comes to, to bear after uh, 1990. Um, but that's, that is uh, after a long period of dormancy, because I think, as Jonathan will tell you in a second, a lot of the, the money that he was a part of have left, leave Shanghai and head off to Hong Kong. Right, because so um, after the war, I mean, ultimately, Victor Sassoon, who thinks he can rebuild everything, as James was saying, that, that's, a, that's a fool's dream. And Victor Sassoon, having fallen from this great height of being a playboy and a billionaire, leaves China, leaves Shanghai, never goes back, um, and loses, uh, loses hundreds of millions of dollars. The Kaduri family, which had always grown up under Victor Sassoon's shadow, they were extremely wealthy, but never as prominent as Victor Sassoon, they decide to go to Hong Kong. And their father, the patriarch, um, dies in, in Japanese captivity during the war. And in some ways that frees his two sons who had very much grown up in their father's shadow to kind of make their own way with the business. And one of the things they conclude is that um, their father made a mistake, um, that, that he didn't see what was happening. He missed the rise of communism. He was living too much in a bubble in his mansions and surrounded by servants. And so the two younger Kaduris who are in their 40s when they arrive in Hong Kong decide to do things differently. Um, and over the next uh, 40 years, they become immensely wealthy. Uh, they actually become richer than ever. They control the um, electricity company in Hong Kong. They build the Peninsula Hotel chain, which is very well known and world famous. Um, today, they're the richest Western family in China and probably the 10th or 11th richest family in all of Asia. Um, but at the same time, they also do something their father never did, um, which was to reach out to the Chinese and to refugees. So for example, hundreds of thousands of refugees flee China when the communists take over. The Kaduris pour a lot of money into helping them get started with farming plots. They sponsor research to improve the food supply in Hong Kong, including uh, developing a new strain of pig, which produces more meat. Uh, one of the jokes the Chinese tell about the Kaduris is they know everything about the pig except how it tastes because they won't eat it because they're keeping kosher. Um, and, um, and they're also very careful in what they say about China. What's striking to me is the Kaduris were just brilliant businessmen, but incredibly smart as, as political figures too. Whatever their private views, they never criticized China publicly, even during the Cultural Revolution, even when Hong Kong was threatened by the Cultural Revolution. They always kind of keep uh, avenues of communication open in the belief that one day China and Hong Kong will need each other once again. So Hong Kong goes through this enormous boom uh, in the 60s and 70s, um, where it becomes one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Um, you know, the, the living standards are, you know, I think by a factor of 12 greater than on the mainland. When China opens up in 1978 and Deng Xiaoping opens things up, one of the first calls China makes is to the Kaduris, asking their help, asking for their investment as a sign that China is sort of open for business again. And Hong Kong benefits enormously from that. I think what's striking now is that if you're the Kaduris, and I, I've talked to them recently about this, they built this huge fortune in Shanghai. And then as we've described, it all comes crashing down around them. They are Wiley Coyote, there's nothing beneath them. They go to Hong Kong, rebuild it all again, and they wake up now thinking, wait a second, we've seen this movie before, which is that despite all their success, despite their political savviness, despite the fact that they meet with Xi Jinping and other leaders all the time, they're facing a circumstance now where will Hong Kong be the next Shanghai? Uh, 
and will they once again lose lose everything? I think it's a kind of sobering moment for people who bet on Hong Kong, bet on Hong Kong being this international city, to discover that, well, no, it's now becoming just another Chinese city. Not surprisingly, we have a couple of questions from the audience about the future of Hong Kong, um, about the new national security order, and then also the fact that um, basically, Someone says, as we speak, President Trump is announcing that he has signed an executive order rescinding special treatment for Hong Kong, and it will be treated thus, quote unquote, the same as the mainland. What is the long-term impact on citizens in China likely to be and on the economy? I mean, that's a tough question. I mean, I think the reality is that right now, China and China's leadership is much more concerned with control than anything else. I think they saw that, you know, we all talk about pandemics these days and infections and how infections spread. And I think the Chinese leadership is very worried about democracy and protests and dissent. And they saw in Hong Kong this spreading democracy movement, dissent, um, and, and they, they don't want it to spread. And so they're, by cracking down, they're sending a message to their people as well as to people in Hong Kong. What's happened is that as Shanghai has come back, as James describes, as Shanghai has come back, economically, Hong Kong has become less important. Hong Kong was enormously important to China in the 80s. Um, but I think the Chinese government's calculation is we can take a hit on Hong Kong because the rest of China is, is booming. Um, so, um, unfortunately, I, I think Hong Kong is entering this period where, like, these great protests that we saw, you know, that was perhaps... I don't know, maybe that was Hong Kong's Champions Day. That was really a time when Hong Kong kind of stood up and did the courageous thing. But as in 1989 with Tiananmen, uh, the government will not stand for that. Um, James, I don't know what yeah. your view is. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think, um, you know, up. I remember getting this question regularly and people would talk about Shanghai and Hong Kong and like, where, well, where's the place to do business? And I would always say, well, you would always rather do business in Hong Kong than in Shanghai because you had the rule of law and you had much more transparency than you had in Shanghai. So yes, the market opportunities were greater in Shanghai, but your money, you never knew where it was going to go and you never knew how it was going to be protected. And, and in Hong Kong, you had that. Um, well, now things have changed and not in the way that I think a lot of people may have hoped, if not expected, is that instead of Shanghai becoming more transparent and more open to um, more open to uh, international standards and more subject to the rule of law that Hong Kong is now becoming less so. Um, and so I think that that's really a difficult, uh, going to be a difficult question to answer. And I, I, I look for reasons for optimism, but I don't, I don't have a lot at the moment. I have to say it's been a, it's been a really difficult year for, for people in many, many, in many, many ways. And this is one of them. One I would, I would point out that I don't think is necessarily obvious to people who don't do China as a, as a, as a living uh, is that Hong Kong has been really valuable and COVID is one example, but really valuable because it's provided a window and a place for journalism to be exercised. And people could go to Hong Kong and you could get an insight into what's going on in the mainland, even if the Communist Party didn't want you to. And that gave a lot of information about SARS, which was not that long ago, um, given information about COVID, uh, gives information, all sorts of things going on in the mainland. And that has really been been stymied. Um, you've seen this be um, be played out with the expulsion of journalists from the mainland and included in that expulsion of journalists from places like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal uh, and the Washington Post. It also, they're explicitly ba barred from reporting from Hong Kong. And so that's a, that's a huge, uh, I th don't think people fully appreciate just how, how little information we're going to have free access to about China in the years to come. I mean, one thing I would just say as a bit of optimism is before I, I, I wrote this book, I spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe as a journalist. And one of the things about the revolutions of 89, the end of communism, was in Eastern Europe, these were states that had been under oppressive communism um, for decades, right? And suddenly, in the matter of one year, all these communist regimes fell. 
And that taught me, I guess, when I was covering it, that you never know what's going on around people's kitchen tables, what people's, the memories people are carrying around with them, what parents are telling their children. And so in the same way, James said that a lot of the, almost the kind of political DNA of Shanghai or the cultural DNA of Shanghai you saw today, and that's why Shanghai feels different. I guess I do hold on to some hope that in Hong Kong, but maybe throughout China, you know, there are people who are going to remember this time and remember the change and will hold on for some liberalization um, and some some possibilities for the future that it may take a while. Um, but one of the things that revolutions we've learned all around the world is they always catch you in an unexpected way. And people often carry around a lot of memories that maybe they don't talk about publicly, but that maybe when the right leadership comes along or the right opportunity, they take to the streets once again. Was there any sort of tension between the Sassoons and the Sephardic Jews and the refugees um, in terms of practicing Judaism, uh, synagogue, etiquette, etc.? Was there any experience? And then also there was another question related to that that notes that there is still a Jewish community in Shanghai that numbers between two to 3,000 and that the population is still uh, generally pro-Jewish. And um, if you had any sure about that. So I, I, Victor says, so the Sassoon's views of, of the Jewish refugees were really class-based. I mean, again, remember the Sassoon's were this grand family, they ruled over Shanghai, and they saw these bedraggled refugees coming in, and they thought, well, you know, they're the poor relations. So um, while Victor Sassoon was quite generous towards them and supported them privately, he was having an affair with a writer for the New Yorker, Emily Hahn. And he would refer to these Jews as the leavings of Europe, the ones who had kind of been swept away. They're not people he would normally associate with because he preferred to associate with the British aristocracy. Um, and, um, and, but as I say, he did support synagogues. The Sassoon family had built many synagogues um, and they were used by these Jewish refugees. So there was a kind of solidarity brought on by the horrors of, of Nazism. In terms of the Jewish community today, that, that 2000 figure are really Jewish businessmen. Uh, they're Western Jews. They're not, they're not Chinese Jews. They're Western businessmen or businessmen from Israel or places like that. And they're the ones who are the Jewish community now. We also have a, um, a question about the synergy that existed between Hong Kong and Shanghai in terms of both um, sort of banking and also architecture. Is it just simply the same families with influence or are they sharing architects? I mean, what is, what is how would you characterize the synergy between the two cities? The the energy between Shanghai and Hong Kong is, is tremendous. And it's really, I mean, the question could be going in a couple of different directions, but I'm going to take it to mean like after World War II, um, you certainly have a lot of, you have people and capital uh, and ideas that flow from Shanghai to Hong Kong. And that's not starting something new. I mean, the HSBC, you know, one of the main characters in my book is, is the manager of HSBC, you know, which is, stands for, I don't know if everybody realizes, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. I mean, it is an internet, one of the largest banks in the world, and it had its origins between Hong Kong and Shanghai. Um, so that's what really fuels the growth of Hong Kong is people and capital coming from, um, I think I said it backwards, what fuels the growth of, growth of Hong Kong is uh, people and capital coming from Shanghai in the years immediately after after the war. And so that includes architecture and banking and, and all sorts of, in the film industry, Hong Kong's film industry owes a lot to what came from, from Shanghai. Yeah, and I think I, I'm, in terms of architecture, I'm not sure they're sharing architects, but they're sharing ambition. You know, they're sharing this desire to be an international city. I mean, again, you know, when I lived in, in China for three years um, with my family um, as a journalist, and our kids were little when we went there. And when we arrived, I remember my 10-year-old daughter was puzzled, she said, because all the pictures she saw were of, you know, pagodas and those kind of beautiful paintings we see of, of, of China. And then you go to Shanghai, and it's this incredibly cosmopolitan city and, and Hong Kong Hong Kong is like that as well. So I think what both cities share is this global outlook and this desire to be considered like, they don't want to be like Beijing, they want to be like London, they want to be like New York, they want to be like Los Angeles. And I think that's a legacy of this globalized DNA that, that Shanghai gave both to its own citizens, but also to the people in Hong Kong um, who then left Shanghai and started anew. Yeah, I agree with that. You see a lot of that energy in, in um, 
in uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai. And people will, people in China will also often comment that Shanghai feels different from other Chinese cities. And that's sometimes a good thing and sometimes not. I've had conversations with, with Chinese friends who they, they don't feel comfortable in Shanghai because it doesn't feel to them like a Chinese city that in, in ways that other ones, other ones do. I think we are going to close it out today with a question about 5G technology. Um, um, someone wants to know what, we, what you think about the new trade agreement between China and Iran for oil and for 5G technology. And I think it's really interesting because the, um, the two families, that Jonathan, that you write about, of course, come from Baghdad. Um, and so their origins are, are sort of in what becomes modern Iran. Um, but any, any thoughts about well, Yeah, I, I don't think the families have anything to do with it. I mean, it's more sort of a geopolitical question. Uh, I think two things. I think the Chinese are expanding everywhere and they're trying to use soft power, whether it's technology or education or cultural exchanges or building infrastructure in poor countries to win political allies. And that's what the 5G uh, expansion is about. And the deal in Iran is that they'll do that in exchange for oil, which they need very much. At the same time, Britain today has also announced that it's going to pull 5G out of um, out of uh, out of its network, and I think part of what this shows to me is, I think China right now could use a little bit of Shanghai Hong Kong business sense, because no matter what the Chinese are doing on the business front in dealing with these countries, it's all blowing up in their faces. They're being very heavy-handed. Um, they're requiring kind of all sorts of, of political signals to be sent against Taiwan and, and against the US. And it seems to me like a lot of it is backfiring. If your best allies in the world these days are Iran, that's not a good place to be. Um, they're fighting border clashes with India. They've clearly got the US and Europe angry at them. Um, Taiwan is furious. Uh, I'm not sure that um, things are going quite the way China would like it uh, to go. And I wonder if looking back, they'll look at Hong Kong and Shanghai and say, you know, maybe a more open, globalized, cosmopolitan view of the world might have been a better way to go. I, I think that's true. Uh, and I think that one thing that does illustrate also is that the reason that the Chinese have this opportunity is because the United States has been withdrawing from a lot of multilateral and international institutions. And so if, the, ironically, if the, if the Chinese government were to have some more of that, that Hong Kong, Shanghai business sense, they might be able to take advantage of, of this U.S. stepping back um, much more effectively than they, than they have been. So I think there's maybe uh, faults on both sides that are going to have some uh, unanticipated consequences for both countries. Well, as I well expected, a fascinating discussion. Thank you, gentlemen. Meredith, thank you. You did a wonderful job and hope to see all of you in Dallas and even more. I hope that all of you can follow your passions and, and get back to China sometime in the not too distant future. Want to wish everybody uh, uh, safe health. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.